Section 12.8 is change of variables and multiple integrals. Um, this is sort of analogous to the substitution rule or u substitution from a single variable calculus, but it's, a, it's kind of the opposite of it. So we'll see that as we go along here. And we've actually been doing this change of variables and multiple integrals already. Whenever we converted a rectangular integral or a rectangular coordinate integral or any double integral to uh, polar coordinates, we were actually using a change of variables. Um, there's actually a, a, an example in the textbook that shows that this change of variables will satisfy um, the same formula we have in this section can prove that this was our formula for polar integrals. So remember in polar integrals, we had a, a situation where x is now a function of r and theta, and we swapped out x as r cosine theta, that being the function of r and theta for x. And we did a similar thing for sine and y, is y is equal to r sine of theta. And the important thing to note here is that x is a function of r theta, y is a function of r theta. And the reason we might consider x and y being dependent on two variables r and theta, or potentially more generally u and v, is because that might bring us back to a more simple region to integrate. Typically with polar coordinates, that was because we were looking at a circular region. And if we're looking at a circular region in polar coordinates, the limits of integration will be constants, or essentially uh, circular regions in polar coordinates are the rectangles of that region. It's another way to think about it, zero to two pi and the radius going from zero to some, some other number. Uh, now, we'd like to generalize that so we could change to any sort of coordinate system we might prefer without actually thinking too much about that coordinate system. So, We'll think about general transformations T, which take a point UV in the UV plane and map it to XY in the XY plane. So some point UV is now equal to some point XY. So we can't really see the graph of such a function, but we can imagine what it does in the sketch down below. We'll have a look in just a moment. So the transformation T is really a function that takes a a vector u comma v or two points u, or two coordinates u and v and returns uh, x and y as a as another pair of coordinates so that means that x is really a function of u and v and y is also a function of u and v we might sometimes denote that as x of u v and y of u v just as we did on the previous page for r and theta x was a function of r theta y was a function of r theta so down below, let's have a quick look at this, just to see this in pictures, and we'll go back for some definitions. So we're taking a region S in the UV plane, and I've drawn this one as a somewhat regular form. I've drawn it as a rectangle in the UV plane. Um, of course, if we we're going to polar, back to polar coordinates, R and theta, that would be, be better drawn as a circle. Typically, we'll just go back to some rectangular coordinates. Um, the idea is this. We like to take a region that's less regular and has complicated boundaries and, and thus complicated limits of integration and convert it back to think of it in terms of a, just a rectangle. We can continuously transform something like this region into something like this region and make our integral a lot easier to deal with. Now, how do we do that? That's really the point of this entire section. So, what we realize is that T is mapping points U and V to points X, Y in this image set on the right here. So we're mapping all the points of S, the set S, the square or rectangle or whatever it is, into this less regular set in the X, Y coordinate system. And what we're thinking about is we, we initially start with an integral that's over a region like this, and then we try to find a transformation that would have gotten us there from a rectangle. And if we can do that, then we can simplify our limits of integration and maybe even simplify our problem. So T is called a transformation or sometimes a map from um, UV space into XY space. And this is again, not graphs of these functions, it's just showing the domain of T and then the codomain or the range of this set S or the range of T. So, Let's see some definitions above. So if T has continuous partial derivatives, first partials, then it's called a C1 transformation. We'll assume that unless otherwise specified, every transformation T that we look at in this section will be a C1 transformation, meaning it has continuous partial derivatives. 
Um, transformation T is a function from a subset of R2 to a subset of R2. It's exactly what we're seeing in the picture down below. We've got S is mapping to that less regular region in the XY plane. From R2 to R2, we see subsets of R2 to subsets of R2. Um, the image of the point X1, Y1, I'm sorry, X1, Y1 is the image of the point U1, V1. In other words, wherever U1, V1 maps to under T, that's its image. So I've got that terminology in place. Um, a function T or transformation T is said to be one to one if no two points have the same image. In other words, if UV maps to XY and there's no other point in S that maps to XY. So each point maps to its own point in the image set. And we call uh, the image of the set S, which is uh, the image of all the points in S, we call that the image of S. Right? That is the set of all points um, in S for which T maps to. Or it's the set of all images of the points in S under T. Okay, so if this were S on the left here, and T of every point in S was in fact equal to this irregular set on the right, then that would be the image of S. It would some, we'll sometimes denote that as uh, T of S, something like that. Okay, so our goal will be to find transformations sort of in reverse that will land, that will give us the image S that we're trying to integrate over but S will be a simplified region in the UV plane, and that will be how we simplify our limits of integration. It does come at some cost, and we'll see that in the formula when we're done. So let's work with a transformation to begin with. This is one of the hardest parts of this section, um, particularly coming up with a transformation is the hardest thing that's in this section. Uh, but even viewing what a transformation does can be tricky. So we're given a transformation, um, we have x as a function of uv, and we have y as a function of uv. And we're asked to find the image of the square 0 to 1 for u and 0 to 1 for v. So we plot the square just for reference in the uv plane. So I've done that over here. I've identified the sides in such a way that these arrows will point to the direction of increase. So for the, for the first thing we'll consider, to consider each one of these sides, and figure what each one of these lengths or line segments maps to in the image space of x, y, we set u equal to zero. That's exactly what this line on the v-axis is. It's when u is zero and we'll let v range from zero to one. So that's what we're doing here and that's even marked off to the side uh, with this line being the segment that we're pulling out from the square and thinking about. It's easier to think about these things in pieces than all at once. So we fix u to be equal to zero. So what does that make our function x? x is now equal to negative v squared. y is equal to 2uv. If v is zero, then x is negative, as u is zero, sorry, u is zero, then x is negative v squared and y is zero, two times u times zero. So that's our, these are our functions along this line segment of that square. Well, this fixes us. Y equals zero fixes us to the, to the x-axis. We can't leave the x-axis because y is zero. So then as v ranges from zero to one, x ranges from zero to negative one. And we can see that we plotted either end of the points that would occur here. So when u is zero and v is zero, we've got this coordinate pair. Uh, oops, we have this coordinate pair, zero comma zero, so we're at the origin. And when u is zero and v is one, we have the coordinate pair zero, negative one. Now, what kind of path do we travel between those two points? Well, it's a straight line because y is equal to zero. We can't do anything else. And we see that x, even though it is a squared function of a v, remember v is just a parameter. All it's telling us is what speed we travel along the x-axis um, when we're talk about, talking about parametric equations. So let's have a look at where this thing ends up. It's a line in the xy plane along the uh, line segment along y equals zero. It goes from zero, zero to negative one, zero. 
and we have marked it and indicated with the same mark above single arrow um, that this is where that line segment of the square maps to in our new uh, plane. So, you know, doing this without all the work laid out ahead of us, we wouldn't have any of the other three curves there. We really wouldn't know where this is yet. Uh, we'll get to those in just a moment. We would just draw this first segment mark it and say, okay, this came from the left side of the square and let's continue on. So continuing, we say, let's fix u equal to one. Of course, there's no particular order to this. We just fix a variable one at a time. If we've got useful um, endpoints, u equals zero, u equals one, things are a little bit more simple, so that's nice. When u is equal to one on the square, we're talking about this line segment. And we let zero, our v range from zero to one, so V is ranging from zero to one along the line segment U equals one. So that's what we're looking at. It's marked off to the side as well of the work that we do here. And to see this in a little bit more detail, uh, U equals one tells us that X equals U squared minus V squared. Well, U is one, so this becomes X equals one minus V squared. Again, we're using the original formula for X and we'll do the same for Y and we'll see that U is, or y is equal to 2v. So we have our transformations along this line segment and what we'll want to do is see possibly what function x and y are of each other. We have a single parameter v so we'll eliminate the parameter. We realize that v equals y over 2 so we make that substitution here. x equals 1 minus y over 2 quantity squared and what we get from this is a, is a curve in the xy plane. Now let's see where it starts and where it finishes. We'll need our two endpoints. We'll need to know uh, what x at one zero is, and we'll need to know what y at one zero is. Well, when we evaluate each of these functions at u equals one, y, uh, v equals zero, we get the point one zero. When we do the same for u equals one, v equals one, going to the other end of that line segment, we have the point x of 1, 1 equals 0 and y of 1, 1 equals 2. So we know that when v ranges from 0 to 1, while u is fixed at 1, that we go from the point 1, 0 to the point 0, 2, as denoted here, and we do so by moving along this curve and the xy plane x equals 1 minus y over 2 squared. Now that's a parabola. It opens to the left and it has x-intercept positive 1. So when y is 0, we get positive 1 out of this. We see that it's a parabola, parabola opening to the left because we have a negative sign in front of that y squared. It's also opening sideways because it's x equals y squared versus or x equals something y squared uh, versus y equals something x squared. So it's opening sideways. Uh, lastly, oh, at the point zero two, well, we know that this thing's going to intersect the point zero two. If we weren't sure about that, we could plug in x equals zero to this, solve for y, we'd realize that we get uh, two for y in that case. So that gives us then, and we were dealing with this line segment in the original square, the right side, and that actually yields this curve. So that's the second thing we would have drawn. We wouldn't have the other side of that, uh, that other similar parabolic arc or the line segment and the positive x-axis at this point. But we keep piecing this thing together. So that was that portion of the square, what it maps to, and we continue onward. And now we, we've fixed u twice, so we should fix v twice. There are two places where v is fixed, right? It's constant on horizontal lines. And that'll be this one and then the, the one below it. So it looks like we'll do the bottom one first over here to the work that we see here. Again, the order doesn't really matter, but we're going to work on that bottom one as identified by, the, by that sort of diode symbol with an open triangle instead of a colored in triangle. And uh, U ranges from zero to one in this case, and V is fixed at zero for it to be on the U axis. Okay, and we find our new equations for X and Y based on the fact that V is fixed. So x is u squared, and again, y is 0. This means that we're going to be stuck on the x-axis if y is equal to 0. And u will range what well, looks like positively as we go from 0 to 1. But we could check our endpoints to see where we should start and stop. So we plug in 
u equals zero, v equals zero, and we get this pair of points, zero, zero on the x, y axis from their outputs. And then we've got uh, when u is equal to one and v is still zero, we have this pair of points, one comma zero for our outputs for x and y. And we see that we travel from zero, zero to one, zero along the curve, y equals zero. So that is exactly what we see um, off to the right here for the open triangle line segment, and that matches that. And we just continue to piece this together. The last one we need to do is that top portion of the square, and we'll see that it will actually fill in for this portion of the curve, and we'll have completed uh, this problem. So that's the top portion of the square is when v is equal to one. V is a constant one up here. So uh, down below, v equals one, and zero, u will range from zero to one. Uh, first, we'll solve, we'll set v equal to one and solve, find our new equations or transformations along that line segment for, for x and y. In other words, the curve that comes out of this. And when we solve for x, we have y over two quantity squared minus one. So that is the curve that we'll travel along. And that's a parabola opening sideways with x intercept negative one. And very similar to what we saw before, only opening in the opposite direction. We can check our endpoints um, to, to ensure that we're starting at negative one, zero by plugging in zero, one. So we're at u equals zero, v equals one, u equals zero, v equals one for, for uh, x and y. So we get the coordinate pair zero, negative one, just as we did in all the others. And we do the same thing for u equals one, v equals one, and we get a coordinate pair zero, two. So we know that for this portion of the square, our transformation travels from zero, negative one to zero, two along this curve in the x, y plane. And that's, what, oops, that's not that one. That is this one on the left side. And that makes up all four curves. That's what the square will map to. And uh, that completes this uh, analysis of this transformation. Okay, again, these, analysis, these transformations are more used to simplify integrals. So if we were dealing with functions that, um, and we'll see functions that will relate to this in a, in a subsequent example, but if we had an integration region like this, it could be somewhat complicated to, to integrate that region. It might be easier to go back and integrate just this simple square. Remember, rectangular integrals and, and the rectangular coordinate system are our favorite. Those are uh, limits of integration which are constant, which means we can change the order um, of integration and whatever we like a little bit more freely. We don't have to deal with more and more complicated functions showing up as we integrate, and we don't have to deal with setting up a complicated integral region. Now, the difficult part is seeing what this transformation would have been. That's hard. It's hard to come up with this on its own. We'll only have one or two examples like that in all of the exercises. Um, in most cases, uh, studying math and physics and engineering, you, a, a common change of variables will be known ahead of time, and students can just use that. So let's have a look at um, how we're going to integrate these things. So our first task is to figure out what the transformation does to our coordinate systems. And ultimately, before we get to the integral, we wanna know what our area is going to be of our image under T. So we're gonna take a small rectangle in uh, UV coordinates. It's going to have a lower left endpoint, U naught, V naught. And its dimensions are delta U, delta V. And we would know that the volume of such a thing, the volume or delta V, of this, uh, of this rectangular region is delta u times delta v. Now, of course, as we take our, uh, uh, you know, as the limit goes to infinity, as deltas become d's, and we have these infinitesimal dimensions of these things, we'll see that later on, but we've got a lot of work to do before we get there. Uh, but we wanna know, because we're going to transform s to t of s under this, C1 transformation or this continuous transformation, we want to know what it looks like. So down below, I sketched, you know, a reasonable idea of what it could look like. And uh, that is this more general region. We're taking uh, something that looks like a, a, 
a flat rectangle in the plane, which is nice. And we're going to a more general surface, right? That's this T of S surface right here. That's a sort of a general image of what T could be doing to this rectangle. It could be warping it, uh, bending it. Um, the, this, this flat sheet could be given some more contours to it than it would otherwise have. And now it's our job to use information about this transformation to see what that's going to do to finding the area of this image. Because if we can do that, then we can integrate over our, our T of S region correctly. So in other words, what is delta A for this blue region T of S for our image set? Okay, so in that order, we'll think about what our images of the point u naught v naught just to start there and that's our and we'll just assume it lands at the lower left it's just for ease of drawing it but it could be at any other corner but at some point on the border or on the boundary of this set uh, so we know that we can find the derivative in the direction u and in the direction v in this space and we're realizing and we're calling uh, uh, our transformation r of u v and it's equal to its components, x is g of uv and y is h of uv. So in other words, to get our, our x, y coordinates, we run u and v through this function and this function for x and y respectively. That makes up a vector function r of uv. We take its der partial derivative or its derivative in the direction of u and, and we end up with what we have here. And we know in drawings, and we'll do the same thing for v, r sub v, the partial derivative with respect to v, or the gradient with respect to v. And we have these two vectors from that. These are the vectors that are tangent to the point u naught v naught, or t of u naught v naught in xy space. This is in the xy plane, or space, or however you want to think about it. And uh, and they're, point, and, and they're giving us some reasonable approximation of uh, the secant vectors to this. Now these secant vectors, A, are just from one point, one side of this, uh, this tr transformation image, and then to the other, okay, just the secant line along each of these curves that, um, that R, R sub U and R sub V are, finding, are giving the partial derivatives of are the tangent vectors too. And we know that R sub u and R sub v are related to A and B respectively because the tangent lines are related to the secant lines by an approximation. We'll see that on the next page as well as this picture again. And what we've denoted what the secant lines are, A is changing u from u naught, holding v naught fixed in both cases, minus where we were. We're vectorizing each of these two, two points. So let's have a look at what that is. U naught plus delta U is this point right here. And this is our, yeah, and, uh, and our R of U naught V naught is this point, the image of it. And R of U naught plus delta U comma V naught is this point. Okay, so this co coincides with this and this coincides with this. And we do the same thing for V. But with this relation, what we know is that the derivative in the direction U is given by this, or the partial derivative with respect to U is given by this. And we can, this is actually the partial derivative with respect to U, not a directional derivative. We can eliminate the limit and put a wavy equal sign or an approximation here and multiply both sides by delta u once we've done so. So we end up with r sub u, the partial derivative of r with respect to u, times delta u is equal to the secant line. So now we're able to talk about what the secant line is as an approximation. It's approximately delta u r sub u. We do the same thing for v and b, and we see that this secant line, which is b, is approximately e, equal to delta v times r sub v. That would be writing this out again, eliminating, eliminating the limit and making the equal sign an approximation sign. So with this in hand, what we're really trying to get at, remember, is what the area 
or an approximation of the area of this image set T of S. Okay, well, we can approximate that area using these two secant vectors because they form a parallelogram. And the area of a parallelogram formed by two secant vectors or two vectors is just the cross product of their vectors or the magnitude of the cross product of their vectors. And that's given below. If this is A and this is B approximately, then the approximate area will be the, the magnitude of the cross product of those two vectors. Now delta u and delta v are constants, so they can factor out of this cross product as just scalar multiples. Um, we'll take them in the positive direction, so they come out positively. We just write them outside of the absolute, or the magnitude bars is what they are because they're positive. And then this is the magnitude of uh, the partial derivative of u times or cross with a uh, partial derivative of r with respect to v. Now, what does that look like in terms of the actual cross product? I'll zoom in so we can see this a little better. This is this determinant matrix here, i, j, k. And remember that r, u has components d, x, d, u, d, y, d, u. Since it's only a two space vector, we append a zero to it. We've done this trick before. We do the same thing for um, r sub v, the partial of r with, with respect to v. First component, d, partial x, partial v, partial y, partial v and we append zero to the end of that one. Simplifying this, we realize that any of the determinants in i and j are just going to be zero. You know, if we do i, we have this submatrix that's not highlighted. So we have zeros in a column, so it's deter subdeterminant is zero. Um, this one also has zeros in a, in a column, so it's also zero. So the only thing we're left with doing a cofactor expansion along the first row is this. You could also confirm that this is the case by doing a, the diagonal method for three by three too. Um, but we have this two by two determinant of our partial derivatives. Now this, this uh, determinant of a partial derivative matrix is so important, so widely used in mathematics that it's actually given a name. It's the Jacobian of the transformation T. It has its own notation. Uh, partial xy, partial uv, that just denotes that, well, we essentially lay it out exactly as we see it, partial of x with respect to u, partial of x with respect to v, partial of y with respect to u, partial of y with respect to v. And if we carry out that actual two by two determinant, remember that it's this multiple minus this multiple and we have exactly what we see to the right. So that's our Jacobian. Now, and that's how we're going to calculate the area of a region in our transformation. So when we move from a rectangle S and UV space to a rectangle or, a, or the new region, the new subregion in, in XY space, our area is going to come about partially from this. Okay, so let's see how that goes together in the next few steps. So yeah, taking what we had previously, remember that we're approximating the area of this delta A area as uh, roughly it was, uh, well, it was approximated by RU um, cross RV times delta U delta V. That's what we had as one of our last lines on the previous page before the theorem. And remember that we've now given this cross product a name. It's the Jacobian, and that's how we'll represent delta A, the areas underneath our image, the areas under our image or under our transformation. Okay, so the rest of this follows more or less as it would for any, any other uh, integral derivation. We, we don't have all the full steps. This takes a, quite a bit of machinery to actually fully prove this. This is just a sketch of how these things would go. But the double integral, over a region R in XY space, in, in the XY coordinate space. Uh, we split it up as a double sum. It's approximately equal to this. Now we change out our variables X and Y for functions of U and V. That's our change of coordinate situation. And we'll swap out delta A for what delta A is from above. And we get the following. We have a function of uh, G as a function of U and V, and H is a function of U and B, replacing X and Y respectively. And then our area in our new space 
is the Jacobian times delta u delta v. Okay, so the area has been put together. That was the harder thing to do. The rest of this has just been a, uh, a conversion of coordinates here and here from uh, x, y to the uv space. And also note that we evaluate the Jacobian at the point u, i, v, j for all of our little subrectangles. Of course, we split our, our region s into subrectangles s, i, j, as usual. And they're mapping to subregions r, i, j in the x, y plane. And coming up with their area, we're using um, the evaluation of the Jacobian at u, i, j, or u, i, v, j and delta u delta v. So taking the limit as n goes to infinity, m and n go to infinity up here, and shrinking those sub, sub rectangles. Um, and then again, this is not a thorough proof of this. We realize that we would arrive at this double integral as follows. Um, so our variables are changed in terms of u and v as functions of x, or as, as uh, outputs for x and y respectively. And uh, the Jacobian matrix is a is, will be a function of u and v, we'll see in the future. And that effectively changes a matrix in xy coordinates, or sorry, an integral in xy coordinates to one in uv coordinates. We're just required to put that multiple of the Jacobian matrix in there. A Jacobian, it's not a matrix, it's a determinant. I'm calling it a matrix. It's set, set up as a matrix, and then we take its determinant. We we'll just call it the Jacobian. So that's the cost it comes at. Um, if you don't have the transformation T to begin with, then it could be some work and effort to, uh, to come up with this transformation. But oftentimes, and most of the problems we'll see, it's given to us, so we don't have to do that extra work. Now, in the next video, we'll do some examples involving this Jacobian matrix, um, seeing how useful these change of coordinates can be. So that'll be video two.